Hey everybody, today we are discussing science and God and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for this especially huge event. We have two heavyweights from the world of science and you could say kind of the, the discussion of science and religion or God. So this is going to be a great discussion. Want to quick mention up front, just a couple of quick things. We are very excited for an upcoming event. Actually, our, our two guests were just discussing this controversial figure as none other than Kent Hovind will be on. This is a debate that's it's continually been kicked down the road and we hope you can forgive us for that. Uh, my fault, at least one of the times where it got delayed, he will be debating Mr. Archaeopteryx and that'll be on whether or not evolution as a theory is dangerous for society. So that's a big one coming up. If you enjoy that topic, we are confident you'll enjoy it. In fact, if it's helpful as a reminder, feel free to hit that subscribe button as that'll give you reminders, especially if you hit that little notification bell as we're trying to build hopefully a fair platform. We would love for all parties to feel like they had a chance to say what they wanted to say and that they were treated well and that we would also welcome all people in the audience, whether you're Christian, atheist, Muslim, Jedi, or even Sith. We want you to know we're glad you were here. So uh, with that, want to let you know that our speakers have their links in the description. And so you can check out their content if you're like, hmm, I like that. Well, you can conveniently find their sources below. So uh, without any further ado, just want to mention that as I had said, these two are you could say titans of this type of discussion. Uh, Dr. Seigart has got a a PhD in, if I remember, it's molecular biology, Dr. Gart, right? Biochemistry. Biochemistry. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Long day. Not a lot of sleep. But we are thrilled to have you here. And Arun Ra, if you have not heard of Arun Ra in terms of these debates, where have you been? This is going to be a huge surprise if you haven't heard of him before, which I highly doubt because he has had a huge splash for, I think it's two decades, uh, Arun, you've mentioned before that it's you've in for 20 years you've been involved in these discussions and you have a huge following so we're thrilled to have both of these gentlemen here just to hear their thoughts and we will have a q a 20 minutes at the end so if you have questions for the speakers ideally relevant to the topic and if you can treat our guests well uh, i feel like i personally owe them because they're so kind to, to come on and discuss here at modern day debate so you can put your questions in the live chat i will scoop them out and then I will read them, and that will be at the very end. If you have a super chat, uh, they will go at the top of the list. And with that, we are going to just open it up for this civil discourse. So thank you very much, gentlemen, again, for being here. And, and the floor is yours. And uh, Dr. Gart, given that you had reached out for this discussion, if you want to kind of get the ball rolling, that sounds good to me. Okay. okay. Um, well... well. Yeah, the reason the reason I reached out was I I happened to see a um, a debate. I guess it was a live debate, Arn. You you'll have to correct me, but it was with uh, Inspiring Philosophy. I think in down in yeah. Texas, somewhere. yeah. And I heard something you said which struck me, uh, and it was your definition of evidence. Yeah. And I what I wrote down was that you said uh, a fact, a definition is a fact object or an objectively verifiable body of facts that positively indicates or, con or conclusively concords with a particular position. Yeah, what I did with that was right. I took the standard definition, which I mean like the most probably succinct definition of evidence I've ever heard was, you know, the fact that indicates. Right. But there's some confusion in that if you go just with that sentence. And I like to keep succinct definitions you know but if you, if you go to the the uh, stanford uh, encyclopedia of philosophy you will get like 17 paragraphs for a definition for any damn word that they're talking about so i, I want i want something that's going to be succinct but also doesn't lend it to to uh, confusion and one of the things that i know is that you know creationists who i'm usually arguing with want to say that we're both looking at the same evidence but no 
the fact that humans are taxonomically classified as apes is definitely not evidence of creationism, right? So that's, you can't claim the same fact as evidence of two different mutually exclusive conclusions. If there is a fact that is that, that consistently agrees with both sides and would still be true in either case, then that's just a fact. It doesn't become evidence until it indicates one or eliminates the other. So that's that's one of the reasons that I said that it has to be positively indicative of, which that that seemed to you know, confuse some people too. They, that that evidence wasn't just they. What I got into is was one person argued that any fact that would still be true in any case in either with in either uh, of the two mutually exclusive positions, he wanted to call if if you can account for that fact where it doesn't change in accordance with your belief, then you're going to call that evidence of your position, which you can't. You know, I mean, no, I, that, that, I, yeah, I agree with all of that. Yeah. But the, the part of the definition that I was concerned about is the word conclusively. In other words, conclusively, con conclusively indicates conclu a conclusively. Let me see if, if I remember that with a particular fact, position. And evident, evidence is a body of objectively verifiable. And, and this is there's a tautology there because I mean, facts are objectively verifiable right. anyway. Right. Uh, obje a body of objective. I just throw that in there so that the people aren't confused. Objectively verifiable facts, which are positively indicative of or right. exclusively concordant with. Okay, there you go. So it's exclusively, not conclusively. Yeah. Exclusively, okay. I probably wrote it wrong. Right. Yeah. With, so, and, and then I have to specify that it's it's exclusively positively indicative of or exclusively concordant with one available position right. Right. over any other. And the reason I say available. Is because of course we get to discover something else and realize that everything not only aligns with that but there are things that are inconsistent with that that also align with this and right. so we have to bear open the, the, the things we haven't discovered or found out yet so this was all in the context of a statement you made i think it was in response to a question that there is no evidence for god yes none right and with this definition that's not that that statement is not unreasonable because i don't know of any i mean it, there may be people who disagree with me but i don't know of any exclusively concordant evidence that points to god and not to the absence of god yeah i, I just made a i just recorded a, a video about that and I'll be, it's not out yet, I'll be editing it, you know, tonight and probably tomorrow because it's like a 5,000 word script that addresses this. But one of the things that I go into in that uh, is a number of the things that I've heard declared as evidence for God. Okay. Yeah, and one of the ones that I, that I see the most commonly, or two of the ones that, I, that most commonly come up, uh, my family frequently brings up uh, um, near-death experiences. Okay. You know, and, and then I see, I have seen where people of non Abrahamic religions are like, I think this woman was Sikh and she had a near death experience and she has this, uh, this, this vision that accords with her religious perspective but does not agree with or align with the Abrahamic belief. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the details because I'm having to, to look that up when I uh, put the citations in. And it'll take me some time to gather all of those quotes. As I said, it's going to probably take me a couple of days to edit this video together. But if we have people that are having visions that are not related to, to religion at all, or they're not having a, vi a vision at all, or more importantly, if they have a vision that is contradicting the Abrahamic God, that and, it's, and it's for some other religion that they were raised to revere, and this is what they expect under these kinds of... You know, stresses to the brain, then clearly none of the near-death experiences actually qualify as evidence for God. We don't have one case where we have where we can objectively verify you know, and support the, the patient's claim of supernatural knowledge. I mean, what we do have are people that, uh, like, like a couple of times we've had, we've had impressionable children told by their highly religious parents to, you know, kind of in, encouraged to embellish experiences they never really had. And then they recant those later when they figure out that lying is bad. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, another one of those examples that people often bring up for evidence of God is changed lives. That's, that's probably the one I've heard the most, which, again, 
Uh, I, I remember reading this testimony from a, a Thai woman who said that her, her life, she was in shambles and her life com- immediately turned around and everything improved the moment she accepted Buddha into her life. Now, if this happens with just any religion, you know, you, you, you find this religion and now your life is completely better, but it doesn't matter what religion it is, then why would it be evidence for Christianity? Or why would it be evidence for Mormonism, you know? So, I mean, how just because again and it doesn't even have to be not only is every religion doing that which means it's not evidence of any of them but it doesn't have to be a religion either there are so many different things you could just suddenly become involved with i mean religion is a fixation and it is a life-changing fixation but there's other things that are too i mean what if you i'm serious you could take up a new hobby and get fascinated by that and literally change your life because of it. well that happened to me when i when i actually when i became a scientist i felt that I, I felt that I had been searching for something when I was young, because I was brought up as an atheist, and I was not satisfied with the alternative to uh, religion that I was offered by my parents, which was, you know, atheism, but atheism highly flavored with a political slant, which I rejected. So. Um, I was looking for something, and when I became a scientist, when I started studying science, I, I decided that was it, and I was perfectly uh, content, I'd say even spiritually, with the idea of pursuing uh, the scientific truth of you know, how biology works, for example, with the universe in general. So I understand that. And, and I think the examples that you gave, uh, even if you didn't bring up those problems with them they're still not those are not really scientific evidence right i mean if uh, i am sure you'd agree uh that in fact i think you've made this point that uh the way he, if, if people feel something that's not scientific evidence that's not objective it's subjective. so uh which we'll get to later because i want to discuss the idea of subjective evidence but if we're starting out with objective scientific evidence I think that the bar you're setting is way too high because even within science, the idea that you will get evidence which, and, and it's, you, you wouldn't consider it actual evidence until it was uh, exclusively pertinent to one particular interpretation, okay, one particular conclusion, that's a very high bar. And what you, we usually find in science is that you get lots of evidence and you don't know where it's pointing and it may be very weak evidence in fact if you look at most scientific papers what you'll see is uh people say things like this is consistent with or this may provide some evidence for the idea that in other words it's it and and that's not, not just modesty that's actual correct scientific thinking because until you're really at the stage where everything fits together quite well and you're at the stage say where evolution or gravity or the standard model or whatever you're looking at that's well accepted as as real and true until you get there you're not really sure that you the little evidence that you have is actually pointing strongly to your to what you're talking about well to, to address what you just said about the high bar I mean, first of all, the reason that I say that it's a body of facts is because mm-hmm. <clears throat> most of what I've read about uh, the scientific interpretations of evidence do always talk about how it's a it's a collection. It's not it, it's not like the creationists want where they say, what is your proof? They want the one fact that they think they can refute because you, you can refute any one fact through right. some kind of reasoning. If you've got if you do enough apologetics and backflips, you can. You can you can address the what you can remove the one tree out of the forest, and you can select any tree and make that one make that one tree not a forest somewhat. But it is always a body of facts which are all you know, that, that consistent that combined or in combination right. always you know support this one position over any other. And and evidence and evolution is a beautiful example of that. And creationists do have a hard time understanding how all of the overlapping things would not be this way if they were correct in right. what, what they're assuming. So yeah, I don't I don't think I don't think I set a very high bar at all. I can't think of an example in evolution, for example, that that where any of the any of the facts that we use for evolution don't fit the definition I've given. 
No, you're right. And, and, and that's why I use evolution as a counterexample to what I'm saying. In evolution, we, you know, th there was, however, there was a time when that was not true. When, uh, when at the very beginning of the 20th century, when uh, the, the work of Mendel was first brought back by some, I think, originally some Japanese scientists, and people, people misunderstood what the new science of genetics was saying and thought that it actually refuted Darwinism. And uh, it wasn't until uh, the, the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium came along and, and, they, and these two mathematicians said, no, that's not refuting at all. <laughs> because it looked like dominance and recession was going to wipe out the idea of natural selection. And that was not true. So at that point, what happened was not only did genetics not refute evolution, it actually strengthened it. And that took another couple of decades. But there was a period of time when the evidence for evolution was weak. And that's my point. There is in any in any scientific field, uh, the Big Bang is another example. You know, the the origin of the universe, the uh, the standard model. There's always a time when you get some evidence and it's not very good, or it's just it's just a little bit weak. It points to something, and in fact, this is this is how science gets funded. I, and I know about this because. My job before I retired was all about uh, working for the NIH in, in, in deciding who gets funded. And what you, what any grant has to have a hypothesis, okay? The hypothesis is, and a lot of people get mixed up between hypothesis and theory, and you know that. I mean, creation, people are always saying, oh, evolution is just a theory. No. It's, it's not just a theory, it's a theory, <laughs> which is a very high level of scientific statement. But before you can get a theory, you've got to have a hypothesis which says, I think this may be happening, and here are the experiments I want to do to see whether or not it is or is not happening. Yeah. And so you have to propose a hypothesis. Now, you need evidence for a hypothesis. You can't just say, I think Coca-Cola causes cancer, because whatever. And I use that's an actual example, by the way, that I, I got from somebody who was very politically uh, interested in this, <laughs> in showing that. Uh, and But you can say, I think smoking causes cancer, right? Uh, and, and, and the reason, the, the, the difference between them being is we do have the fact being the correlation between smokers and and having no actually that came later the really? the, ori the original hypothesis that smoking caused cancer was due to some observations that uh i have I, i'm not sure i remember all this completely and people can correct me but uh it was um Ernst Winder in the United States, and I forgot the name of the British famous lord in, in, uh, in Britain, who uh, together independently came up with this idea that they had some very weak evidence that people who smoked a lot seemed to have worse cancers. But the problem was, it was when, when that theory was first, when that hypothesis was first proposed, it was rejected because the, the experiments that were done, they were actually epidemiological uh, observations, suffered from the fact that about 80% of everybody smoked. This was in the 1950s. Yeah. So there were very no, there were almost no controls. There was nobody to, to compare to. So the first paper that Ernst Winder put out was showing a very weak correlation of smoking with cancer, but it was a correlation, but it was not really strong, okay? And it was, of course, of course, there was a huge industry against it, so <laughs> they had no trouble marshalling people to attack it, and it didn't catch on for a very long time. Eventually, eventually, some people stopped smoking. There were more controls. The studies got better and better. The evidence slowly built, and now it's back. So it's not disputed by anyone, even the tobacco. Yeah. Uh, all the time in arguing, you know, creation versus evolution. Always, 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 the creationist has to give us the whole damned umbrella. We mentioned this before we started recording. You know, where where Kent Hovind wants to insist that or, that uh, Big Bang cosmology and nucleosynthetic right. theory and all of that is part of evolution. 
even though Darwin didn't talk about the origin of the cosmos and Big Bang didn't come up until... Or even the origin of life, actually. <laughs> yeah, the Big, you know, Big Bang wasn't even a thing until a lifetime after Darwin had died. And that, that both uh, that abiogenesis, Big Bang, and nucleosynthetic theory were all conceived by people who didn't believe in evolution and would, and would have been outraged if they'd seen how they're... You know, but, but Hovind is going to continue repeating this lie. Right. You know, and, and he thinks, I guess, if he repeats it enough that, that people will just take that it's true and then somehow maybe scientists will accept that it's true. I, no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what his logic is there. But if you're talking about weak evidence, now for me, when, when, every, every time this uh, we try, I'm trying to argue about evolution and they always want to move away from whatever the strength is to go to where the weak area is. Right. And I don't know dick about cosmogony i just don't i'm not even interested in the subject so uh, and i've never been someone who necessarily believes in big bang i look at it as a, I've, I've talked to a number of physicists i've talked to a number of, of uh, famous physicists about this directly face to face and have been told you know well honestly nobody really knows you know with with any we, we have all of this this math that implies this but i mean what do we really know for certain about the big bang so when you talk about weak evidence that's probably a good enough example you, you give right there there's a lot yeah that's yeah i mean we we have we we have if the 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 cosmic redshift implies that that uh, the cosmos is expanding then when logically when you reverse that that but does it actually mean that does it does it, does it mean I mean, I can get that, but when it gets down to where we're talking about the singularity, now I'm completely lost. And now I hear physicists saying that they don't even buy the singularity thing anymore. So there's a good example of weak evidence right there. Yeah. So. And, and I think my point is that when you start looking at something scientifically, you start with that kind of weak evidence to allow yourself to propose a hypothesis. Yes. And let's say you get funded, okay, or whatever, and you start now you start testing that hypothesis with the methodology you have, and if you're lucky, uh, your results will confirm the hypothesis. Just, just for or, the or not, just, or do the opposite. Just for the sake of people listening who may not know, um, when we talk about you know the difference between theory and hypothesis, it would it be fair to say? that a hypothesis, and we've already mentioned what evidence is, we, have, we, have, we even gave a definition of what facts is, that it's objectively verifiable data. So we've got everything covered except hypothesis. Now I would say that a hypothesis is, and I'm trying to remember the way that I form it, because I always try to do my definitions as accurate as possible, as succinctly as possible, and also to, to, to clear up any possible confusion that's gonna come out of it. And I don't remember the way I had it phrased for hypothesis, but that's going to be a, let's call it a guess, but one that is testable, an and educated guess. It's usually an educated, an educated guess is fine, and it's it's testable and potentially falsifiable. Exactly, it has to be. Right. Okay. In other words, you have you have, and here's the hard part: you have to figure out a way. And this is when people evaluate grants. In other words, is this worth funding or not? Which is a good way to, to decide whether something is good science. Uh, the hypothesis has to be built on something okay so it has to be there has to be a little bit of evidence even to propose the question second you have to have a way to test it and that often requires methodology and you and and what will be evaluated is will the methods you're proposing be good enough to actually give you an answer yes or no and to the hypothesis yeah and, and i understand that one of the rules is that you can never prove a hypothesis correct well, we don't even use proof. We just, we just, we. Well, either, it's like it's like going into a court case and proving. <laughs> it's like, it's like going into a trial and proving someone innocent. Right. You can right. you can you can say we didn't prove them guilty, right. but that doesn't mean they were proven innocent because there's no such thing as right. proven. So, so in much the same way, you can't have a hypothesis proven correct. You can only disprove. It. Yeah, that's right. Because if you if you say that something is proven then you're admitting that there's no possibility that something else won't will come along and refute it and that has happened so often in science that no one we don't just we just don't use the word proof we just and the reason i brought that out of course for for anyone listening you know especially for creationists listening to understand that that proving any theory true would be 
just as is, is the word dishonest is it inaccurate we in, inapplicable inaccurate. Yeah, it's inapplicable. as proving someone innocent it, it, it just it's one of the rules and the only reason right. that evolution hasn't been proved true is because it's against the rules well i yeah and i mean it's you know gravity wasn't proved true either and in fact gravity is still true it's a theory uh but it, you know the 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 the, uh, the the best example people always give is that einstein came along and gave us a whole other theory of gravity that doesn't contradict newton's but it goes further than newton and it, and yeah. it does more about it so yeah it, we don't use the word proof but we do try to establish uh whether the hypothesis is valid and w if it is we can then develop a theory which is a much higher level and it usually involves more than one hypothesis it usually involves, as you said before a body of evidence that includes and that gets me to that gets me to another thing that i want people to understand is is what a theory is so a theory right. would be a body of knowledge that includes all these different hypotheses that's right exactly. it obviously includes all of the facts that are supportive of evidence and then also and i don't know a lot a lot of people don't do this it also includes laws because there are laws there are there are natural laws that are specific to different fields i mean like mendel had laws of genetics uh, uh von Baer had laws of embryology right so and there are actually laws specific to evolution that don't apply to anything else that only but they are natural laws that apply to evolution specific to that so a theory would include the facts the hypotheses the evidence of course and the and even laws in and, that the law, and the laws we should say um the way you distinguish a law is that it's generally mathematical or at least quantitative so well, I've I've seen a number of laws that are, and this is this is especially true in the case of the the laws for evolution. They're not mathematical laws, any of them, and and neither are von Baer's laws of embryology. They're all, but they're all summary sentences. Yeah, they're uh, of right. something that is consistently true in a given set of circumstances. And, and there are there are some mathematical formulas for laws in evolution as well, but they're not used very often because they're, like many other laws of science, they basically relate to models. But well, we, then I, I have so, to. I have to admit that uh, I'm getting my my information about the laws of evolution from Darwin himself and also from er, uh, from Ernst Mayer. And to, right. to my so, understanding, neither of them posited yeah, mathematical. They did, but uh, a good book to look at is Evolutionary Dynamics by Martin Novak, and he's got several of these mathematical formulations in there. And Brilliant. Yeah, it's a it's a great book. Oh, actually, well, thank you yeah. for that recommendation. I. I don't know when I'll have time to read anything. Well, <laughs> just through it, you know, I I actually heard about this first from P. Z. Myers. Actually, <laughs> he was we were having a discussion and he brought it up, and I'd heard of it, but he had a copy with him and he opened it up and. You, you know, mentioned it. you mentioned that that one of the life thing your life changing thing was was becoming a scientist, and I have to say, in a very similar note, the same kind of thing was for me. Uh, I I feel as though I've I've lived kind of like four distinctly different lives over the course of my 56 years, divided into into four sections. And at one point, I come out of, of one stage of my life, and um, I kind of got into the the news groups thing back back when those when that was a thing, you know, on Usenet, you know, and got into Talk Origins. And you mentioned PZ Myers, PZ Myers, and and Richard Carrier were both on Talk Origins at that time, along with a whole bunch of other people that I ended up later on meeting in real life. And I don't know how I immediately got sucked into these conversations and comparing the arguments of creationists versus the arguments of science. And I started reading abundantly. And I spent about a decade of my life doing nothing but this online research. I was working in a job that allowed me to do that. It had I had this like the inexhaustible period of time in which I could do I had I could only read. And so I did that and and I found it enormously satisfying. And it was a very, very changing situation for me it caused me to look back on my previous incarnations if you will um actually with a bit of embarrassment i would look back it's like almost every year of my life i would look back on who i was the previous year with a bit of you know <laughs> at least i'm not that guy anymore <laughs> get to my age <laughs> it doesn't stop <laughs> yeah, well very yeah yeah and, and on that note i got to bring up i just 
I've just been accepted to University of Arizona for a uh, Bachelor I, of Anthropology. I saw that, yes. You, so, you uh, either I, tweeted it or I saw that. Congratulations. I'm very excited to go back to school again, even if it Great. is only online. So. Great. I guess your, your professor will be uh, interested to have you in the class. <laughs> I took anthropology in another school in a community college, and I remember that the, the test was a little funny. There's two things funny about this class. Uh, when I took it before, uh, the, the the professor wanted he was using an antiquated definition of hominid, so he was using a hominid as a bipedal, human-like ancestor or human ancestor. Now, hominid, and, yeah, they changed all of that, right? Yeah, yeah, that that definition doesn't fly anymore for right, for reasons right, right. that if you look at the logic of it, you know, it obviously had to change. So now, hominid is is any member of the family hominid or the subfamily hominidae. Right. And I tried to explain it to him. I could show him proof. I said, I'm going to answer this test question <laughs> the way it should be answered. Yeah. But I want you to understand, it's not that I'm wrong. Before I answer it, I want you to understand it's that the test is wrong. Okay? He wouldn't give me credit for that. <laughs> well, you know, before we get into the, the rest of this discussion, which will be where we're less in agreement than we are now, I just want to say that, and I've already told you this, and, last time two years ago we had a discussion but um i just want to say that your knowledge of cladistics and biological phylogenetics is remarkable i mean uh, i really don't know anyone else including professional zoologists who have that breadth of knowledge so that's what i'm saying i'm a little i'm a little worried for your professor because <laughs> <laughs> It's not clear who's going to be teaching whom, but anyway, no, that's great that you're doing that. I, the, but now let me get let me switch gears a little bit because I'm glad we had this discussion about evidence and hypothesis, etc. Because it all bears on, and that's the reason I thought it would be interesting to talk. This whole question of whether there is evidence for God. So my view is that there is evidence for God, but that it's not the kind of strong evidence that one gets, for example, after doing experiments or doing observations or testing a hypothesis. There is, I would say, there is enough evidence for God to, if, to make this analogy, it's not really a good analogy because God is not part of the natural world, so, but if, let's assume that, it, that God is, just for the sake of argument, would fit into that question of reality, of, of whether it's testable. And I think that there is enough evidence for God to warrant the idea of testing a hypothesis. But we have a problem, and that is we don't know how to do that. Uh, you said something a few minutes ago, which is very important. You said uh, that when you were talking to physicists, they said, we don't know. And that's probably the three most important words that a scientist can say. I don't know. It's something, and you will agree, that you never hear from creationists because they know everything, right? That there are no unanswered questions. Uh, well, that, when you, whenever, and I used to, people would say to me on occasion, okay, you're a scientist. I hear two scientists arguing about something. How do I know which one is right? And my answer is the one who says he's got it all figured out is wrong. <laughs> by definition okay yeah. and at this point we have evidence for the existence of something i mean god is a good word but we could call it creator we could call it a spiritual force outside the universe something that created the universe that's that there is some web evidence for that but at this moment at this point in time we don't have the tools to test it well, and then we God. also have to know what God is, or and and here's right. why this is important. Uh, I came across a poll that I thought was it was a mistake in the poll in the way that they worded it that produced a really amusing result. The poll was asking, uh, like National Academy of Science or some scientific collective in the United States, they were asking the scientists uh, whether which how many of them believed in God. Do you believe in God? They could have just left it with that, but they didn't, because they wanted to clarify what they meant by God. So. Do you believe in God, comma, or a, what was it, um, a higher power? Oh, yeah, I know that. Uh, or a higher power. So, that's so, the pew poll, right, right. They're only clarifying what they mean by God. But the scientists, almost entirely, it seems, 
misread the question. Do you believe in a choice between a God or a higher power? And so the majority of them said no, if I remember correctly. I don't actually remember the numbers. And then uh, some of them said that they believed in God. And I think there was the, the, the second largest category was those who did not believe in God, but did believe in a higher power. Right. Implying that they believed in something that was even a higher power than God. Which I thought was a beautiful result. Just, just for the mistake in the question to get a result they couldn't have predicted that they were going to get. Yeah, I, I know that poll quite well, it, and what it what it is is it's interesting because there's often debates on whether there are most scientists are atheists or most scientists are not atheists, and depending on how you interpret that question, you're absolutely right. You can get either answer because it's something like I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like. 30% believe in God, uh, 30%, these numbers are not right, but it's something around that. 30% do not believe in anything, they're atheists. And in the middle are this, the missing 40% who say it's a high, somehow a higher power. Now the question is, what you raised, what does that mean? And I interpret it, and I thought most people interpret that, is that they're not religious, so they're not going to say that they believe in a god because then the, then they have to ask, then they have to say, well, I'm Catholic or I'm Muslim or I'm whatever. Well, they could do it well, like Einstein and Spinoza did. Well, like that. Okay, so I think that that's what those people are saying is that they and, and just to cl just to clarify that too, and I'm sorry that I that I I, I, oh, sorry. I try not to interrupt so much because you know it, you don't want to get known for that, and apparently I already am. I'll but, let you know if you do. <laughs> but, you know, you, you always hear the contradictions about, you know, people claiming Einstein both on the atheist side and on the and on the, the, the believer's side. And, and Einstein made very clear that what he believes is not what the creationists, what the Christians, what generally the Abrahamic faith, what, so far as I know, what any theistic faith would identify as a God. And yeah. he made clear that what he believes in is like Spinoza's God, that it, it's like that there's a sense to the universe, and this is not a personal God that he doesn't believe in. He definitely does not believe in the Bible. He called it fairy tales with no justification. You know, so so Einstein is not, he's not theistic. Right. And now, he, what well, he said, from the perspective of a theist, a theist should regard him as atheist. So for all intents and purposes, he is atheist. If, you, if you're a Christian and you and you, then Einstein has told you that from your perspective he's atheist right but from my perspective as an atheist he's not because he right. believes that the universe has some sort of spiritual order. right that it, yeah that, that, that the universe is set, itself is imposing this order so that Einstein believes in this higher power that is not a god right so my I mean that's probably close I, I think that's close to what I think about Einstein, but I, and I think that that group, that group in the middle there, that's a high, the higher power group, I don't, I don't know if there's a word to them, but I think they have a mixture of views, and I think some of them are right there with Einstein, many of probably a lot of them. Some of them are thinking, well, God, no, I don't want religion, but there's something else, there's something else besides you know, the pure materialistic reductionist view of the universe. There's some, maybe a creator, maybe maybe it's an alien in his mother's basement who's, you know, typing us all out on a, on a hologram or whatever. But there's something else that we don't know about. And those people tend not to really think about it much. They certainly don't go to church, as you said. They don't consider themselves theists. But they don't consider themselves to be, you know, uh, Philosophical materialists, or you know, that that kind of thing. Which they, is why I want to I want to thank the host when he uh, when he started this and he he acknowledged uh, the Jedi and the Sith. Then that is <laughs> that is that is significant to me for a couple of reasons. One, it does play into this because if you are Jedi, that's a higher power that is not a god. That's one of the options that you were just discussing. That's and right. The reason that that's significant is because that that. Before I realized what atheism actually meant, and that in fact I was an atheist, where I'd been lied to all my life about what the word atheism means, right? But until that point, I, when I still believed in supernatural things, like, you know, I thought that there was scientific evidence for telekinetics. I thought that there was scientific evidence for telepathy, for, I thought 
that I mean, I was a neo, I was a neo pagan occultist at one point. I mean, I I've experimented with transcendental meditation, astral projection, all of that kind of shit. Early so in I, I, I thought I had direct evidence right. of supernatural things, and so I was literally Jedi. That was my sincere religion, and I declared it such only because I hadn't yet read the Tao Te Ching. If I had somehow managed to have read the Tao Te Ching before seeing Star Wars, then I would have called myself a Taoist. But I saw Star Wars first, so I was Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, that that's... Getting back to, to what I was... I mean, I, I think that that poll that you mentioned is, is a good point, and, and you mentioned it because of the importance of defining what we mean by God. And there we are as a christian and i know what i mean by god and it but it's not a scientific definition it's a faith-based definition it's a definition uh that comes from non-scientific sources such as the bible uh such as uh, my own personal experiences which are not scientifically uh useful uh and i think that's true for many christians however aside from that the idea uh, the, 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 some of the facts about the universe, including especially things like the fine-tuning of the cosmological constants and the fact that the universe began, which was kind of a new and shocking event when it was actually uh, became public in the 60s. Uh, and is already being discarded now. It's not being discarded. John it, Carroll? John Carroll came out and said that the universe never began. Well, Belenkin says that the past eternal universe is impossible. So we can argue. We will, let, we will let the physicists argue. You know, because neither of us are. You're right. <laughs> Let's leave it alone. But in fact, in fact, that's exactly what I'm talking about. This is exactly what you get when you've got some data and you don't know what it means and you're trying to formulate a hypothesis and a theory and you keep arguing and trying new things and trying to find things that, that will fit. Uh, and so we don't know yet, but it's certainly the, uh, there's certainly evidence, okay? It's not proven, it's not finished, it's not even really a well-developed theory yet, although it probably is a well-developed theory, but it has possible holes that the universe began. And in terms of the fine tuning, actually, I don't know if you remember, but you, you and I discussed this when we talked a couple of years ago. The fine tuning argument has also been attacked and somewhat uh, withered because there are a few cases of the fine tuning which turn out not to be that fine. It's more like coarse tuning. Yeah, you know, but, the, and the, probably the, the biggest, the, probably the biggest issue that I have with uh, with the fine tuning argument is the fact that thinking logically if you're going to fine-tune a universe for people then why are we only able to exist on a fraction of the surface right. area of this one i have an answer ball. to that yeah, what's yeah that? i have an answer to that. the answer is that that's not what fine-tuning is often mischaracterized as fine-tuning for life that's not what the fine-tuning is it's, the universe is not made for life at all what the fine-tuning argument is is that the universe has stars and energy available energy and there are very probably very few planets although there are a lot of planets so there's probably more than very few but there are a small number of planets where there's even the possibility of life and we have to be on one of them and that's just the anthropic principle but the fine tuning of the constants is what gives us a universe that's more than just hydrogen atoms yeah, or, I, I need to i need to cite lawrence krauss in this one because he wrote an article to the Wall Street Journal wherein he contested the fine-tuning argument saying that the constants oh, are not as, as tuned as finely to any degree no, that's as, true. as, as that's what correct. people were saying. He said this that's is correct. an exaggeration. It, it is. And in fact, I heard that just last week at a conference I was at, actually a, a conference of Christian scientists for the American uh, Scientific Affiliation, just put in a plug for them, uh, and, and one of the, you know, Christian physicists got up and started attacking the fine-tuning argument. Uh, but it didn't demolish it. What it did was it's, and I was actually relieved to hear that, because when I hear that the constants are fine-tuned to the degree of 1 in 110 to the 120th, 
that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, that makes me think that this is not really fine tuning. This is some kind of fluke or maybe some strange law that we've never found. So I'm actually I was actually relieved to hear that that you know the argument you mentioned from Krauss. This is coming from from research which was being uh, cited by both the guy at my conference and by Krauss. And it turns out that, for example, the strong force is not as finely tuned as we thought. Some of the other things are also. However, the way that the way that, that uh, argument is erroneously presented, I, I mean, I admit the you know the, the 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 fraction of the planet that we exist on is an erroneous representation of the fine tuning argument. It's the one that usually is brought up, you know, in arguing with creationists versus evolution. And but one of the other ways that they bring that up incorrectly, which is the one that makes me laugh the most. You know, is that if uh, this is what I actually heard, you know, if, if the Earth were one foot closer to or further from the sun, then we would have these these problems. Right. And some, some people give dif different variants. I actually did hear one foot. Uh, and so one, one other person said something along the lines of 100 miles. If we were 100 miles closer to or further from when, of course, we are not only are we capable would this planet be capable of life if it were in venus's orbit or in mars's orbit right we would still be capable of life which is a huge range but the fact is is that our orbit is an elliptical and already exceeds those boundaries naturally every year right. but of course when you point that out to somebody and they, they they've given you this impossibility and that that proves god that's their evidence of god is the impossibility of this thing and then when you show them that it's not impossible the fact that is captains commonly that's not even disproving their own argument somehow. They just ignore that and repeat it to somebody else later or repeat it back to you if they forget that you already know it. Well, see, the, prob the problem with any fine-tuning argument for God, even the one that I propose, which is that there is some degree of tuning, whether it's fine or coarse or medium or whatever, there is some degree of tuning which we can't explain. The problem with that, and, and many of my Christian friends uh, point this out, is that it's a god of the gaps because the real truth is yes the constants appear to be finely tuned for stars and for the kind of universe that we could live in uh but we don't know why and and there are several possibilities one is simply that there's a multiverse and our universe has those constants which is one universe of trillions and in all the other trillions there's no there are no stars or whatever. Uh, and, and ours is the one that we're in because obviously the improper principle says we have to be in one where we can be in one. So that's one possibility. The multiverse, of course, is not is also not proven and is actually also there's evidence for it. Uh, but it's not, you know, it, it's an alternative. So uh, the other possibility, of course, is that there may be some physical law that, that might... Um, that might account for the tuning of the constants. Uh, there's no clear idea what that could be, but it's possible. So it is a bit of a god of the gaps, and there are many apologists, Christian apologists, and other Christians who won't use that because of that of that possibility. However, can... well, ahead. let me just finish this thought. However, despite all of that, the fact is that again this is why i brought i began with the whole idea of weak evidence because that is evidence it's not strong evidence but it is positive although weak evidence the existence of god and so my whole objection to your How original is it evidence of god well evidence of a creator evidence of some evidence of a creator it's evidence well that's one theory in other words how do you how would you get no, not, I shouldn't say use the word theory. That's one possibility. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> one possibility for explaining fine tuning is the multiverse. Another one is some physical law. And a third one is that some agency, and it doesn't have to be God, it could actually be some intelligent agency outside of our universe that, you know, from, again, could be a hacker, you know, yeah. uh, designed the universe in such a way that it would allow the stars and eventually you know the evolution of people so that possibility has some evidence it's not enough to say we have shown you know scientific strong scientific evidence for god you should now believe but it is enough to frame a hypothesis 
that the evidence was created and designed. That, sorry, that the universe was created and designed. Okay, well, we first have to agree, and I think we do, about possible. So, you, know, you said that a number of things are possible. And it, if the common, you know, uh, low-hanging fruit of the religious world were right when they said that anything is possible, then for you to say that this is possible or that is possible would be meaningless. Everything is possible. So we know that some things are not possible. And one of the definitions that I use that, that people get upset about is that in order for us to say whether something is possible, there has to be a precedent or a parallel, or in this case, you've given great examples of a verified phenomenon indicating that such possibility exists. Mm -hmm. And so even the multiverse, which is it would, would require different physics, obviously, being extra universal. Yes, correct. Right? Right. Uh, sure. we, would, we would grant that, that as far as we can tell, if the, if the singularity is a thing, that's going to require physics that we don't yet understand. And, and there's going to be a different kind of nature outside of our universe. Since we are, we are restricted to this one set of laws, who knows what might. And we, so we don't have anything that would restrict or, or disable the existence of that multiverse. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just as likely as anything else. Right. But the, the, the issue with God, and we, again, we have to decide what a God is, is my understanding of a God is impossible. It, it's, I understand because, let, let, me, let, me, let me put it another way. We'll get to why God is impossible, but I first want you to explain what is your definition of a God. Well, it, it, again, my own personal definition of God is does not come from any of these arguments. It comes from my religious faith. And you know what that definition is because- No, I don't. <laughs> Well, it's, it's the standard Christian definition of God is the creator of everything. God exists as a trinity. It, all the Christian uh, views, uh, the religious views of Christianity related to God. God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, God is omniscient, omnivalent, uh, etc. You know, is able so, to see everything, do everything, etc. Yeah, so in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Greek or the Hellenist pantheon, mm -hmm. you know, we have we have Zeus or Jupiter that, that created everything. And then we have Apollo who carts the sun around the earth. Or if it's right. not Apollo, then it's, uh, what, what is this, uh, the, the, yeah, that other name? I can't remember. But you know, the, the, you have the guy with the chariot who's carting yeah. the, the sun around the earth. So is that a god? Is Apollo a god? Well, there, yeah. I mean, the, no. Because, see, there's a big difference between the Judeo-Christian view of God, which also the Muslims got, and all the gods because polytheistic gods are very, very different in basic character from the concept of God with a capital C. So your definition... They're not, they're, not, they're not the same, they're not within the same definition. Okay, so your definition, though, eliminates hundreds of gods that were worshipped by millions of people for thousands Correct. of years. Yes. And so that is in act that you can't do that you can't under you can't define what everybody believed all these people believed as a god you can't say no my god is better than your god so your god isn't even a god anymore no my god is different it's not it's not the same character in other words the whole point of the early part of the bible is to reinforce this very revolutionary strange weird idea that uh god is not equivalent to the statues and the humanist, the, 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 the human appearing uh, and, and acting uh, gods, little g gods like Zeus, like Apollo, who basically were superheroes. They were basically superhumans. They they were they were you know they had lives. They had love affairs. They had sex with other gods. They did all kinds of things. They, they cheated at wrestling by punching Jacob in the nards. <laughs> and that's your that god. Was an angel. That, did that was an angel, actually, not a god. But well, that's no. I think that was think <laughs> that, that was, was that was a god. That was big G God, walking uh, around, talking to people, having lunch with people, sitting yeah. down with people. And, and, that, and that shows you that at the beginning of this new faith, there was a lot of confusion among people who believed it and they kept going reverting back to the old ways and in fact that's even in exodus where 
Moses finds them, how many times did the Hebrew people go back and start, you know, making statues and worshiping Baal and doing all Because that was what everyone in the world was doing. And the idea that there would be a capital G God who is transcendent, who is immaterial, who is imminent, who is, you know, and all powerful, but not physical, not, not, you know, another Except that he was. That was the new idea. He was physical. He's described physical over and over again. He, yes. he, at one point, he has to wave his hand. He has to hide his face so that Moses can't see him because he said, right. nobody can look on my face and live, which means he has a face. And then at other points, it says that Moses and God spoke face to face. At one point, there were 72 people who were allowed to look upon God's face at right. the same time and then live. And God, three guys walk up to Abraham's house. Isn't it? Yeah, it's Abraham. Three guys walk up to Abraham's house, knock on the door. He answers the door. He recognizes one of them and says, oh, hi, God. So there's three guys. One of them is God. The other two become the angels who go down to Sodom, you know, and risk risk getting getting raped. And this is where the most righteous man in the in the in the entire area offers his daughters to a rape mob rather than to allow homosexuality to happen, because allow criminality, just not homosexuality. That's fine. That's because that's that's God's way i guess so the two guys are gone there were three at the door two left how many we got left okay right so there's one guy there and there's a point where, where it says that abraham drew nigh to god and i've seen i saw a christian cartoon that depicted this scene and abraham is talking to a star and the star is twinkling the answer but but that's not what it says is Arn, it? what you asked <laughs> you asked me what is my definition of God? Okay. And, and guess what? Definition that my definition of God from? comes from the Bible, but it's not equal to the Bible. Okay. In other words, I'm a Christian. Okay. I'm not following what I mean. I'm not a theologian. So okay. there will be Christian Christians who will answer this question very nicely. Okay. I don't know the answer. But I, there is no answer for this. There's the no Bible answer. Says, the Bible says that God was. There's three guys there. Two of them yeah. left to Sodom. Uh, we have one. We have one I left. And, and that God, that guy called God, then sat by the tree with Abraham and ate with him. Right. So it doesn't matter what the cartoon says about the twinkling star. We're talking. We're not talking about a star. We're talking about a guy sitting on his butt because he has one, and he's eating. <laughs> Right. And that's not the God that I believe in. But it's your Bible. Well, actually, I consider my Bible to be the New Testament. So you're just going to dismiss the foundation. I thought, wasn't no, there I something in the, in the New Testament against taking away every, every jot and tittle? I don't dismiss the Old Testament, but I don't interpret the Old Testament the way creationists <laughs> and you Interpret. Okay, well, I, I get that. But just understand that the Old Testament, the Old Testament says that it is against God to add to this, and then they added the old, they added the New Testament anyway. And right. the New Testament also says that it, you can't take away. So now you've done both. You've added a testament you were forbidden to add, and now you've gotten rid of the Old Testament that you were forbidden to get rid of. Well, I'm not getting rid of it. I'm just not interpreting it the way you do. I'm interpreting it as, uh, as, as books several books that were written by several people who were inspired by God, but they were not, the, and, and of course God's word is inerrant, but... Except he, that it's wrong about everything. Except <laughs> when, when people try to write it down, they get it wrong. So that's, that's why, why God himself got it wrong. He shouldn't have been using people. Who should he use? Himself. He could write his own damn book. If oh, he was going to no. write a book. But he he have, if, if there really was a God, he wouldn't write a book, and we wouldn't need to believe anything on faith. Instead, he would present actual evidence. Everybody can see God. Everybody can know God. We can all feel okay, God. We, good. we hear the thing about the apologists say that we all have this God-shaped hole in our heart, which is complete bullshit. But let's just imagine, if there really was a God, we would really have that. I wouldn't be atheist. Nobody could be right. atheist. And so what would, what would we have in that case? We would have the entire world knowing not believing but knowing that there is a god who's in charge of everything right there would be yep. no it, it would be scientifically and completely objectively proven that god is real uh he's in charge okay you think that's what god wanted 
Well, if that's what the that's what the presuppositionalists say is already the case. They say that I know that there is a God, and that which we all know. Which I'm not a presuppositionalist. I I'm glad of that. We would completely have disagree. I, I don't know if I'll ever have a debate with the other side. You know who I'm talking about, so I yeah. don't really need, But if I did, it would be uh, interesting because I'm not a presuppositionalist. I don't believe that at all. Yeah, and, and his what, argument is so easy to disprove, even with his own scriptures. Well, I, I, I don't even understand it. But the point is this, that uh, it's often asked, if God were real, why doesn't he prove himself? All we'd have to do is, you know, uh, do something, answer every prayer, okay, that's ever asked, or do something else that, that works that shows that God is real. And I mean, just I, the fact that we pray at all is indication that, that God does not exist. Because the reason that you pray is to reinstate, to reaffirm this, this delusion. I mean, if you, if you talk to any imaginary friend, it doesn't have to be a God. It can be the spirits of your dead ancestors. It could be the extraterrestrial telepathic reptiles in charge of the Illuminati. You can be talking to a literally a soccer ball with a bloody handprint on it. Eventually... <laughs> Your imaginary friend is going to start talking back. Yeah. So it, my, my hypothesis on this is that the reason that, that your God became, and, and all gods are magical, anthropomorphic, and morphous. They have, anthrop they have anthropomorphized uh, characteristics. They have human characteristics, human intelligence, and so forth. Uh, they are immortals in that you can kill an immortal, you, they just don't die of cancer or old age. So you, you know, there are rituals, there are means of killing an immortal so that that can be done. And they're magical. They have supernatural powers. And all of that, that describes every god ever worshipped by anybody. And that includes your god. And now the reason that yours became uh, um, transcendent is the reason that I have the name Aaron Ra. The reason I, cho they, I used that name when I started on Usenet on, on Talk.Origins but back in like 1997 or thereabouts. The reason that I did that was because I wanted to call attention to Amen-Ra, which is a composite air god and sun god in Egypt, because they, him and Yahweh have a very, very similar origin. I mean, they apparently had the same wife at one point, Atherat or Asherah, depending on how you, how you pronounce it, what region is going to be pronounced different ways. So originally when they had wives, you know, Yahweh is like a humanized character, and, and Amen is a humanized character, but then they lose the wives, and they become full elemental, both of them. So Amen became air, and you feel air everywhere, and that's, that's what made him an everywhere thing. I mean, they, the, the problem was that the people who wrote the Bible, clearly not God, clearly not inspired by God, there is no God, they thought that air is spirit. So when they see a dust devil, that's literally a devil. When, when they open a bottle of whiskey, that's literally spirits. That's why they call it spirits. You can see the, you know, the evanescence and everything. And so you, what do you have? You, you have a desert tribe, and a dust devil comes and throws all your tents around and everything, and then it just vanishes into nothing. That's supernatural. And that's when they, when they come across a volcano, you get the Pentateuch. So... All I can say about almost everything we've been talking about the last 10 minutes is that I'm not very good at theology, but you're really bad at it. I mean, you don't <laughs> know any theology at all. Well, so, why would you say uh, that I'm bad at that? I mean, I get that a lot. I, get, I do, because I don't interpret the way people want me to, because I can't. Because so this when, is I see, when I see this 60 times that the Pentateuch refers to God as a volcano, I accept that it's talking about a volcano. When it, when it says that, that it's a column of smoke by day and a column of fire by night, that's a volcano. And there are many, well, many other references to that. The, 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 the thing that, that Christians like me always say is that young earth creationists and atheists share an identical way of reading the Bible, which is that every word has to be taken at face value in the same way as every other word. Well, and I wouldn't say that's, that that's true because that's, when I, and that's a non-theological <coughs> reading scripture. I, I would, I'm going to contest you on that because it's, that's not the case. I mean, uh -huh. I, I always read Genesis as metaphorical. Okay. I had, to. I mean, cause the only value, uh, the only value that, that, that the garden of Eden story, the, all of it, you know, like through generous Genesis three, 
the only value all of that collectively has is if it is a metaphor. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it literally does not make any sense if it's literally true. Mm -hmm. And it has no value if it's literally true. At least it at least says something memorable. I mean, if you if you have childlike innocence and then you discover the difference between right or wrong, you can never return to your childhood again. Right. You can. It's like that old adage. You can never go home again because home has changed. Right. Well, then and in this case is you've changed. So you can't be the innocent animal or the innocent child or whatever prior state you were in once you achieve this level of sense. So you're interpreting the story of Adam and Eve in the garden and the story of eating from the tree, etc. So you're interpreting that as a metaphor and, and that's very good. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that, but why don't you use the same approach for the rest of Scripture? Because the, the, the descriptions that, well, like I said, when it, when it talks about air and constantly mixes that with spirit, when Jesus gives up the ghost in one translation, he breathes his last in the other so breath spirit right yeah. ecclesiastes 3 18 to 21 it talks about how who knows whether the breath of the beast goes down into the earth and the breath of the man goes to ascends into heaven in a different translation that breath becomes spirit again yeah, that's right. and in, in in genesis 1 you know the only the spirit of god moved over the face of the waters we know that that's the wind they're talking about right. so when, again, when the Bible very clearly is describing a scenario, even, even including Sodom and Gomorrah, that the stone wind and all of that, or no, I'm quoting the Quran now, sorry, I'm getting them confused, because the Quran just ripped off the Bible on this, this the, when they're talking about Sodom. They're clearly talking about how, how impressive would it be, right? If you think a dust devil is literally a dust devil, a volcano would blow your damn doors, right? That's impressive. Especially when you have know, volcanic eruptions also prompt lightning. So damn, we got all the gods doing this thing. But I mean, you know, I, I, the point is, I mean, there's language about you know God. Th th there was a, a a storm, and God was not in the storm. There was you know uh, I don't know an earthquake. There was all kinds of stuff, and God was not in any of those. Well, most of it is explained by a volcano. I mean, and most yeah, okay. most of the most of the trials or the, the 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 curses and the exodus are also explicable by. But are you are you claiming that that the theology is 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 saying that God is the volcano? God is in the volcano? No, no, I'm not saying that theology is saying that theology is much like apologetics. It's distorting what it actually says to say something else. So well, you, now, you, now you have, you're getting back to the young earth creationist. That, you, you, with theology, you have you have the improve you have the approved interpretation of these passages. I'm not going with theology at all. I'm reading what the damn thing says, and I'm right. com coming to other uh, what I think are vastly more reasonable conclusions about what it's talking about. What inspired this? Well, you know, uh, it, that that's interesting because the question of what inspired and what they're talking about and who they're talking to which was a very ancient audience uh which who had no knowledge whatsoever of what we now know uh is is an important part of interpretation of what the scripture means and what theologians and there's not one approved answer there every theologian has a different view of what the bible means uh and i've read some of them, not I'm not extent I'm not highly educated in theology, but I read enough to know that there are some very interesting theological interpretations of scripture that to me make a lot of sense and don't uh, lead me to believe that it's all a bunch of nonsense and I have to read what the scripture actually says word for word literally and either believe that or forget it. No and what I, mean, I encounter there's no way that I, there's no way that I could possibly, as you know, be a literalist in terms of scripture because there's so much wrong from the very beginning and genesis one i agree with you entirely but I, but that's exactly the approach that one should take i believe to the entire body of scripture certainly the old testament which was which is very old was written by many people with different points of view and many of these different points of view were adapted from earlier polytheism some were. We, some, we know the some, origins they, of some of those. There were influences. That's right. But and then the, the Exodus itself wasn't even a, a thing about Egypt. I mean, I understand that there, there's some scholarship that says that that was actually their Exodus out of Babylon, and they just kind of like added Egypt for whatever reason later on. 
you know, maybe but for the, political reasons. But the point of scripture is to provide lessons in how to live, how to behave, some of which And that's are, where the Bible fails the hardest. It, it doesn't ju it's not just wrong scientifically and historically. It's wrong ethically and morally. It gets everything wrong. What if you I've often said that if anybody that uses the Bible as a moral guide would be a criminal in every country on this planet. <laughs> Today. I want to give Sai a, a quick chance to respond and then we'll probably shift into the Q&A. So Oh, Thanks so already. much. Wow, we just got started. We've uh, only been an hour and 15 minutes into this, sir. I, I'm okay with going longer. I just didn't want to take, I didn't want to kind of uh, assume too much of your time. Okay, well, you're right. You're right. Uh, let, Aaron, I, I would I would like, instead of responding to that, I would like to get back, because I, I really am not good at speaking about theology. Uh, but I would like to get back to this issue of evidence and you, the la where we were was that you had said that whether or not we can assume this evidence of any kind, even very weak evidence, just evidence enough to allow for hypothesis building, depends on how we define God. And that's what led us to the definition of God, which is where we are now, uh, as far as I'm concerned, embroiled in a swamp. <laughs> and, and that swamp is called the Old Testament. Uh, yeah. So I'd like to get out of there and get back to this question of, okay, so what do I mean when I say this evidence for God, capital G, God? And what I said was, uh, and, and this this would involve, going back to your comments about the, the Pew survey, this would answer the question of the majority of scientists who either believe in capital G, God, or that other group, which believes in some unspecified higher power, Einsteinian, Spinoza, and whatever. Whether it's pantheist or, or, or deist or, uh, well, not, probably not deism, but uh, maybe Jedi, something like it that. Could, it could be deism. It could be deism, yes. I think deism still qualifies as theistic, though. I mean, it's still a belief in a conventional concept of a god. Well, okay, so th they would be included. So those people uh, have this sense of what god is, and you asked what my sense is, and that's where I made a mistake of bearing into uh, the, the, you know, my, my Christian definition. But I didn't want to bring that up because that's not, a, a, at least I was hoping, that would not be our discussion here. I mean, what I wanted to restrict it to is, is what my view, if you're looking at objective scientific evidence and the fine-tuning and the origin of the universe of two of the uh, issues that I would say could provide some degree of evidence for a creator God, uh, that definition is very vague, but it mostly would center, in, for the purposes of this discussion, on an agent, an agency that is responsible for the creation and maintenance of the universe as we know it. Okay? Now, there may not be anything, okay? That's the other alternative. It may just have happened through some unknown random process that we don't know what it is. Divine tuning may be just a fluke. There may not be any purpose or meaning to the universe or to life or to us or to anything else. Uh, and, and that is an argument that could be made. Uh, it's not a very, I mean, I don't particularly like that argument. It's kind of depressing to me, but that's not relevant. It could be true. I know many atheists have said uh, an ugly truth is better than a beautiful fantasy, and there's some truth to that statement as well. But I don't think, see, I don't believe it's a fantasy. Uh, and so, the problem, though, so so all this gets back to your comment that there's no evidence for God at all, because what I'm maintaining is there is some evidence, but it's not sufficient to be able to even come up with a testable hypothesis at this time. Okay, and what I want, to, before, before you interrupt, I, I, I want to get into this last part because it's important. Uh, you have to think about this, and this is very important. Biology used to be considered a branch of metaphysics. It was not considered science. Science was physics and later chemistry, and then there was philosophy, biology, you know, all the other fields, you know, rhetoric, language, all the other fields 
were metaphysical. And biology was considered metaphysical. And the reason is, people looked at living things and they said, well, we can't do anything with this. Well, how, how, how do we make, how do we come up with any scientific experiments? What do you do with it? With a squirrel, you know, how, how do you, how do you def- figure out anything about how it works? And very slowly, Darwin was one of the first to actually come up with a scientific theory of biology, and of course Mendel as well. And then later, very slowly, people came up, you know, the first biologists were doing systematics, purity, purely systematics. They were not doing anything that, you know, no experiments, just comparing things, which was scientific, but it wasn't leading to any theories. Eventually, biology became a science. And there are physicists today who will kind of cast doubt on that, I know them. But we, you and I, will agree that biology is certainly subject to scientific inquiry. And that's because of some amazing feats of uh, methodological improvements. We have techniques that we, even today, we have techniques like CRISPR-Cas9, which is brand new. Uh, It can do amazing things that we couldn't do five years ago. When I was younger and, and, uh, and, and actively involved in research, we had something called polymerase chain reaction, PCR, which enabled us to study genes in a way that could never be done. So this keeps happening because biology is still a new science. We're still getting new techniques. Every time we get a new technique, we make new, new discoveries. Biology becomes more and more scientific with more and more theories. Now, in the history of science, you don't even have to go to biology, you go to physics. There have been times when things that seemed supernatural, things that seemed supernatural that could never happen, have actually turned out to be reality. So in other words, what we define as natural and what we define as supernatural is a moving target. Well, we also have to say, remember conversely, every time we've ever assigned anything to be supernatural, it always turned out every single time to be wrong. No, and, it's no. not, and it's not just that our definitions changed. What we understand about the supernatural, i.e. magical, that's because yeah. if, you, if you believe okay. in curses and blessings, those are right. magical enchantments. If right. you believe in a golem spell, of a, creating Adam out of a, out of a golem, that's a, that's a magical spell. Incantations, and, or not incantations, elemental spells in Leviticus 14, so forth, that's all magic. Water bending, necromancy, right. all so of that. that so, so 98, 98 or 99, I'm just making up a number, percent of things that were magical are not true okay you'll agree with that maybe it's right I mean, once upon a time it was said that that uh demonic possession was the explanation right now i know for, that. right you know, for epileptic seizures for disease yeah right. so most of these magical explanations for things turn out not to be true i agree no all of them no there, there's never been one that turned out to be actually magic how about the idea that something can be in two places at the same time? Where was that originally described as magic and then the scientific explanation failed and it remained magic? No, no, no. I'm, we're, we're talking across purposes. Okay. I'm not saying that an explanation for something turned out that was magical turned out to be wrong and science turned out to be right. That's clearly the case. We don't have to argue on that. Well, they, well you're, you're saying that the reverse has happened, too. That it started out with a supernatural explanation, and that the supernatural explanation. Oh no, no, not an explanation. The okay. idea, the idea that something can be in two places at the same time, which was the science fiction, for example, mm-hmm. is magic, right? Well, as is something coming from nothing. But we understand that quantum physics does that too. Exactly, exactly. Quantum physics does a lot of things that used to be considered magical, but they're not. They're real. Now, how did that? But they're also not magical. That's right. That's right. They, we now know they're not magical, but we didn't know that a hundred years ago, did we? Okay. So I, I will grant you that we understand that that some things happen that doesn't doesn't have to be magic. That we would have blamed it on magic, or that what we would have exactly. called magic. Exactly. Okay. And now Likewise, we know that it's not. Now we understand that air is particulate matter. They didn't right. know that when they wrote the Bible, exactly. but they knew you would die if you can't breathe. Right. So that's why the ark is supposed to save everything that has the breath of life, because they literally thought that's what spirit is. And the reason you think you have a spirit is because those guys didn't know what air was. Okay. So let me let me finish my point. Okay. The fact is, and this goes back to this very important words that I said before, we don't know. Okay. 
at this moment in time, what we're calling God, we call we put in the supernatural context. I don't know, <clears throat> frankly, if there is something called supernatural, which is outside of the universe, it might be. But I, as a scientist, believe that ultimately everything that's real is is real is natural. Now, if God we we can't imagine God as a natural being because it just doesn't make sense. But we call it a supernatural being. But that's because we don't know. We're in the same position with respect to God and to miracles and to all the things we now consider supernatural as we were a hundred years ago with respect to things that we used to think was supernatural, like everything that has now been found by quantum mechanics to be natural and real, still crazy, but natural and real, can't dispute it. My point is we could be in exactly the same position in a hundred or two hundred years. Well, I look at it though slightly different than I look at it slightly different than you do, because when you're looking at both the, the, the expanse of the cosmos taken as a whole, or if you look at the the boundaries of that in quantum physics, that you, you're getting down into the very boundaries of what is real. And so there seems to be an overlap with what isn't real, and that's that's yes. why we have quantum particles popping in and out of existence. That's right. But exactly. what we don't have, and what we should have, if there was evidence of God, um, let's say when somebody says you have no evidence of evolution and, and Kent Hovind said this to me in our debate and I said that one of my my evidence but they're my three best examples of evidence for evolution one of them was that evolution happens because if I'm going to say that it happens across this broad spectrum I got to show that it at least happens at all I have to show that it's possible right so I show that that that, that some degree of what he would call micro evolution that happens Right now, he may not. He accepts macroevolution either. He's just too stupid to understand what macroevolution is. But we, uh, I established the possibility. We don't have the possibility for God, for everything that was described, for demons, for evil spirits, for curses and blessings. None of that. None of that is possible at all. And none of it has ever been established. How do you not know? By this it's not, not by your How religion you? or any religion. How do you know it's not possible? Because it's impossible by definition. Why? God is defined as, by his, his miraculous nature, and miracles are defined as uh, things that, that defy the laws of physics, which means they are literally physically impossible, and thus God is physically impossible by definition. They defy the laws of physics as we now know them. So we go back right to my example. Okay. If you have, gets, if you have, if you have an them. electron going through the slit, in two going through two different it, slits. It goes beyond that. It's not just... It's not just that we literally do not have any evidence at all whatsoever, not even weak evidence for God. It's actually we actually have evidence against it. And again, I'll bring up Sean Carroll, who did a series of talks about why the idea of a soul moving on past the body is actually impossible. And that they, and he gives and, and people will say, well, you can't say that that's impossible because it's it's supernatural, which means magical, which means anything can happen. And then it becomes this dream world where physics completely breaks down and we can literally make wishes come true. But Sean Carroll is explaining how you know, the information that we gather into our minds becomes us to some degree. Our experiences form who we are and also the, the maladies that occur to our bodies. Since we are our bodies, there is no separate entity that is the soul. If there was, then brain damage would not change our perception. Neither would chemicals, right? It, we, it wouldn't change who we are, but we know physically we can change how we think about things chemically. So that's what we're literally made of. But then when we die, how does that information that was physical now transfer in the magical? It doesn't work. There's no way to make that happen. We don't know he, that. But, and he's got a formula by which he says he does know that. Now, he, he again, he this is a, physicist. He has a physics formula? For yes. That? Yes. <laughs> no, for me, it's good I enough see. that there's no evidence at all. We're done. If, if you don't have that, you don't you don't have the fact that explain that 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 thing, let's say, what what are these these different facts collectively? They're explained by evolution, or evolution explains these facts, or these facts indicate evolution. Either way, we don't go either direction with God. We don't have a fact that indicates God, and we don't have an instance of anything where God becomes the explanation or can be the explanation. We don't well, we don't have. We can't get into this because time is short. Okay. But the other part of this argument is to use other kinds of evidence, which you touched on, but that is not currently scientific evidence. 
And that's the evidence that you mentioned that uh, you gave you subjective evidence. Earlier. Subjective evidence. Right? Yeah, I, I will grant that that you have you you can have subjective evidence, your personal experience. You're going to call that evidence. I can't deny that. I I had. I'm not going to deny your experience. I can deny mine. Okay. And that was that was troublesome, because as I said, I was a neo-pagan occultist. I had direct right. contact with supernatural beings face to face. Right. And it was a hard thing for me to realize eventually to come to grips with the fact that none of that happened. I remember it. I damn sure remember it having an influence on my life at the time. But then to come to realization that as real as it seemed, it didn't happen. And How do you know that it didn't happen? Because it couldn't. <laughs> and what, you know, and you know, I did eventually you know, get to test this because so I'm using a presupposition that it couldn't happen. No, no, no. that's I not a presupposition. Happen. If you believe something is true and then you investigate it and then post, not pre, post, you then discover that you know that that can't be. You then change your mind according to the evidence. Not a presupposition. Exactly the opposite of a presupposition. So I go okay. to test this because a couple of my experiences were shared. Now, mm -hmm. how could you? And, and, and this is not this is not subjective anymore. This is object, mm -hmm. transcendental meditation, and uh, and and encounters with uh, with let's call them extra dimensional beasties because I was playing a lot of D and D at the time, and that's what that's what of course I would call them. So, I had two shared experiences, and through the power of the internet, you eventually reconnect with people that you haven't seen in twenty years. If it wasn't for the internet, you wouldn't find them again. Well, 30, 40 years in this case. And so I met people, I found people that I knew in high school that I had these shared experiences with. And the funny thing is that I was already out of the belief. I already had come to realization that, that never happened. And here's the sad thing is that I still remember it. And I'm still certain that that other person remembers it too. And, that, and I'm, I'm wondering, how, did, how, how are they thinking about this? So I interview both of them, as you do. And it turns out not only did they remember it differently than I did, but the specific instances that were so important to me, they don't remember those at all. That never happened in their life. It's not just that they believed it once and they don't believe it anymore. Never at all. That never happened. Period. And it, this, was, this was key to so much of what, what I believed about reality. And to find out it, I hallucinated the whole fucking thing? That's pretty impressive, I think. And so... When, and here's another thing important. People would tell me their religious experiences all the time, and I'm trying to analyze how you could have this experience and what could generate that experience and how you could believe that that is what it is and how am I trying to, going to try to reason that person that maybe it's just here's this other possibility. Have you considered that? But when I would tell people about my experiences, when I tell Christians about my neo-pagan occultist experience, they immediately dismiss everything I say, just like when I present solid, provable science. They immediately dismiss all of it. So if you could just dismiss whatever the hell you want, then how? No, I don't dismiss I it that? at all. I, I, just the opposite. I think that I, I've i always thought that you're a very spiritual person. In fact, I said that to you two years ago. And, uh, and cause you I don't, don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, but I do. And, and I, because there are people who are not spiritual. They, they're not searching for anything. They're not... You know, they, they don't have platforms the way you do. They don't speak the way you do. They don't have the passion that you do. Uh, they just don't care. You know, they're just out there doing their thing, and they don't care about any of this stuff. You that, do. that always bothered me about people, too. Because it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's religion or if it's science or it's whatever the hell. I, yeah. People who are incurious bother the shit out of me. Well, that's a lot of people. And you're not there. You're, you've <laughs> never been there. You never will be. So, you know... Well, I completely um, sympathize with your experiences, whether they were real, whatever real means or not, I don't know, that's for you to say. The experiences that I had were probably less dramatic than yours. In fact, we did discuss this, and I came to that conclusion that my experiences were probably, you know, relatively tame compared to some of what you went through. But I believe they're real. Uh, I believe, I, I'm convinced that they're real, not just a belief, I'm absolutely positive. Yeah, well, uh, I was. I don't surprised. want to go through them, but I don't want to go through them because some of them are, are just. I, I, I don't. I don't want. And to. I don't want to. You know, it's funny that I've had these, these. These. They were very important to me at the time, and I don't even talk about them now. I mean, I've mentioned them on stage exactly once. Well, you mentioned them to me when we talked two years ago on your channel. You. you okay. You but on stage once. Okay. 
Yeah, and I people will ask that. me about it all the time, and I'm like, I, I don't even want to go into the details about it. I'll mention that, it ha that, that there's a thing that happened, but I'm not going to go into specifics about what it was, because frankly, it's embarrassing to me. Now. I understand. Now, and, and in fact, I, I was going to plug my book. I have a book coming out in a couple of months uh, about my conversion, oh, my conversion to Christianity. And in that book, I describe what these experiences were, at least most of them. I left out a couple, but three or four of them I describe. And I'm a little nervous about that going out to the public because it's very personal information. But I decided to put it in because I thought it was useful. So the final thing I would say then is that in, in both of our cases, we've had these experiences. You made the determination that they were not real and it was not worth pursuing the idea of a spiritual or a supernatural uh, influence on you, I made the opposite determination. And I will tell you now, frankly, I think that's fine. Because as I've said many times on Twitter and, and on many YouTube discussions, I'm not an apologist. My job, my goal is not to convince people, atheists, who come to Christ. My goal is to, and I've said this to you before, my goal is to try to, to help Christians who are finding a crisis in faith because of science to understand that the two are not incompatible. That you and, and that's what you do that Inspiring Philosophy does that causes me to respect both of you. Because while I think that all religion, every level, is nothing but a crock of lies, just period, all of it, um, there is, there's degrees that I think I'm, I'm happy with. One of the problems that I have in the United States right now is we're so very, very polarized, right? Now, I remember, you probably remember when we were young, when we were children, the common man knew that you would have to be a fool to reject science, science is real. Right. But everybody at the same time had this notion that they go somewhere when they die. And that was, that was the main person, right? And, and the atheists and the creationists were both on very far extremes. But now, we have a very polarized society where that middle of the road guy, that, that overlap, that, that Venn diagram has completely changed. Yeah. So now that, that person who holds both perspectives is almost absent. We're like 48% this and 48% that. We have people who are walking away from religion in droves. That's why religion is in a steady state of decline. Yet at the same time, statistically, we have creationism and other forms of science denial like flat earth and anti-vaxxers and, and geocentrists and all that that's all on the rise because we have people who are walking away from science altogether and to be frank i would rather have that middle of the road guy from the 1950s back mm -hmm. than to have the, the country divided in half between between completely rational people and complete fucking lunatics i'm in complete and total agreement with you and i on this issue so i think james we're probably ready <laughs> Q&A. Very good talk. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Well, thank you both gentlemen. Very enjoyable. And thank you for everybody's questions as well. So pulling those up. Super Chats. Uh, Stephen Steen, uh, gosh, says, objective facts. Yes, James is an amazing human. That's sweet, Stephen. That's very nice. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And Ashley M, thank you for your super chat. She said, Jesus is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Cy, Aaron, and Modern Day Debate. Well, thanks, Ashley, very much. We appreciate that. And it's definitely much less off-putting than Stephen's super chat. So next up, <laughs> Dave Dallafior. Forgive me if I'm I know that guy. Huh? I know that guy. You bet. Uh, he said... Uh, Steve McRae rocks. So, uh, yes. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. Uh, Steve McRae is hosting an after show, and that is linked down in the description. So, uh, just so you know, if you want to hear what the chat is, what people are saying about this conversation, you can hear other opinions down there as well. So, as mentioned, it's linked in the chat. And thanks, Dave Dallafior. Dave Dallafior. Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. Thanks so yeah. much. Steve McRae said, Hardy Weinberg is idealized and not actually physically possible. Oh, that's news to me. I used it a lot. <laughs> Steve, we're going to have to talk about he, that. He says it's a useful fiction, much like the uh, ideal or idea gas law. No. Well, no. Uh, 
you can use Harvey Weinberg. I mean, it's used routinely, for example, when you're looking for uh, the evidence of natural selection. And if you're not in equilibrium, then you can presume that you have natural selection. If you are in equilibrium, you probably don't have natural selection. So I'm not sure. I'd have to talk to uh, Steve and see what he means by that. But uh, we'll do that some other time. You but no, it, it, it's a real law, and it really works. You got it. Thanks so much. And just had a super chat come in again from Dave Dali, Dallafior. Thanks for that. He said, proud to sponsor Aaron. So excellent. Thanks so much, Dave. Glad Thank to have you, you here. Franco or Franco, forgive me if I got it wrong, correct me, True Hillo. Thanks for your super chat in which they gave pictures of monkeys, one with his hand over its eyes, one over its ears, and one just uh, with his eyes wide. So thank you for those emoticons. Diego514, thanks for your Streamlab super chat. Saw that come in, and by the way, so sorry, I noticed I missed some Streamlabs super chats in the past. Uh, I got a couple I'm gonna read really quick. But he said, what's popping, Jimbo? That's funny, I wonder if that's somebody from, I used to go by Jim. So uh, Diego, glad to uh, uh, have you here. Thanks so much for saying hi, and thanks for your super chat. Daniel434, this is an older one. If you're out there, forgive me, I missed this. He said, thank you for your hours upon hours of edification. I don't know if I'm edified, but that's kind of you. He said, I've been greatly uh, blessed by your channel. Keep up the great work. Thanks so much, Daniel. And I can't say how much I appreciate the debaters, uh, as well as everybody in the live chat. I feel like all of our best ideas are from the live chat. And uh, this really is, an, uh, the channel is kind of an abstract entity that I really feel like belongs to the debaters in the audience. I, I just fire out emails. So I'm so glad you enjoy it, Daniel. Zero. James, can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah. Can I interrupt? It just, it just struck me when you mentioned Steve McRae that uh, Arn and I share a particular thing. I don't know if you remember this, Arn, but we are both winners of the old non sequitur show, uh, Golden Nun. Do you remember that? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Yeah, you got a you got an award for best atheist debater, and I got the award for best Christian or atheist debater. This is outstanding. Not, know, <laughs> but we were both on. I think uh, neither of us were completely sober. But, uh, That's awesome. <laughs> it's uh, two superstars. I'm sorry. I just uh, just remembered it now. So go ahead. That's really cool, Dave Dalla Fior. Thanks again for your super chat. He said, "Bullionator rocks too." And yes, Bool does rock. Uh, thanks for that uh, super chat, Dave. And yeah, so we've got a uh, next one was, and this is a, a no, oh, this just came in today. So this is a brand new one. This is 0132132. Thanks for your super chat. He said, is quote unquote supernatural defined well enough to ever say there's a supernatural explanation? I think that's probably for both speakers. Yeah, that's that's a challenging one because for me, the supernatural is anything that is, you know, like from beyond, you know, and, it, and a lot, some people will say that supernatural means beyond nature. And I kind of take it as being not natural. You have the unnatural and then the unnatural and the supernatural is the unnatural. And that includes every kind of mysticism you can imagine. They're all in the supernatural, the ghosts and gods and evil spirits and magic spells and all, of everything that's in the Bible is all in the supernatural category. So I, I just, it's just easier for me to call it magical. It's one less syllable. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think that's largely true, but I don't agree about the Bible. I don't think everything in the Bible is supernatural. I think a lot of the important stuff is, but not all of it. Uh, and I think the definition of supernatural is a tricky one because what I said before is that what it, today's yesterday's supernatural is today's science and today's supernatural could be tomorrow's science, but we don't know. Uh, and, and most of what we now consider supernatural probably will not uh, become scientific. It'll just be discarded, but some of it might be. And, uh, you know, we don't know until we know. If we, if I can just throw this out there, I think Genesis 30, I think it is, it might be 32. I could be having them confused, but you know where where you you, you plant the stakes, right? Striped stakes. If cattle mate while looking at striped sticks, they'll bear striped calves. Right. That is never going to be genetics. That's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. Okay. You got it. Thanks. Lysenko and Lamarck are not. Uh... <laughs> Thank you yes. so much. Uh, next up, we uh, just a quick couple of new subscribers. Santiago Rangel and Jay Lehman. Thanks so much for subscribing. Stoked to have you here. I feel like I, I could have sworn I missed one. I'm so sorry, but uh, thrilled to have you here. And by the way, somebody asked about the link for the after show and that's right below the links for the speakers. So both Sai and Aaron are linked in the description and then right below their links is the after show link for this uh, discussion. And uh, praise I am that I am, thanks for your super chat, just came in, he said, did Ra ever recant his stance on uh, Pistis? Okay, so I think this is uh, the- uh, No, I'm, I am an apistivist, <laughs> which means I know what the word Pistis means. It means that I didn't you know, say so. So pistis, I understand, had was uh, it, it was one word, and we and de depending on the context, depending on how it was used in a sentence, it could mean belief, it could mean persuade, it could mean uh, convince, it could mean uh, what what is the other one? Uh, trust, right? So I mean, there's all these different contexts now with faith. That's the one that in the context, it, and now all of these are applied in the in the ex in the specific or the cited examples. In every case, it's loyalty. Right, so you're supposed to adhere to this idea because you trust that person and not for any other reason. It's not that evidence compelled you, it's because of authority. That person's authority compelled you, not evidence. So yes, I always understood what pistis was, although I have been hot, hotly misrepresented for that, especially of late. But as I said, I'm gonna have a, vi a video coming out explaining that in the next couple of days. I'm work I'll, I'll be working on that as soon as I get off of this. You got it. Thanks so much. And next up, we have a number of questions. Craig Nightwolf, thanks for yours. Excited about this. He says, question for both. What does each think is the best evidence for evolution? Again, the fact that, it, that it's directly observable, that we see it happening. That's, I think the, the fact that we see it happening, is, it's, it's pretty good. Now, if somebody, if, if, if the supernatural were real, we would have people like Gandalf and Spock and Hermione and, and Obi-Wan that would be able to demonstrate that there's a thing there. Now, even if we couldn't, exp even if we couldn't explain it, if we had to call it supernatural because science is just completely overturned, has no idea how to explain this because it makes no sense, it's physically impossible, yet we have the verified phenomenon, we have it happening, right, consistently, then we'd have to admit that there's a there there. But we don't have that in any case. Gotcha. Thanks so much. So wait, uh, it was the question was what is the best evidence for evolution? That's that, right. Okay. So the best evidence for evolution is that the data that we have from paleontology, geology, biochemistry, genetics, molecular biology, and I'm probably leaving out a few oh, anthropology all of that data from all of these different fields all point in one cohesive direction and that is the theory of evolution is true and and if i understand the intent of the question to to, to name just one thing that qualifies as as the best evidence and exclude everything else then that would be actually the first evidence that was ever discovered it was a christian creationist in the 1700s who, just, who, who came up with systematics, you know, with taxonomy. That is the thing, because Carolus Linnaeus, who believed that, that speciation was impossible, that new species could not come about by any means other than special creation by God, and yet he, and he's expecting to find created kinds. But when he does his classification, he doesn't find created kinds. He finds an intricate tree of kinds within kinds within kinds within kinds within kinds that in, the, in a pattern that only can be explained by evolution and directly contradicts any concept of special creation. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Next up, History Net. Thanks for your question, he asks. Uh, for R. N. Ra, can you name one scholar or uh, academic holding a university chair that defines faith as a belief without evidence? And Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to list a whole bunch of them. Uh, I went to the uh, system, well, excuse me, the um, I'm going to come out with a video in a couple of days that's going to be citing a whole lot of people to show that, yeah, I've always been right about this. A handful of people want to lie about me, and Eric Hernandez wants to come out with a few videos about me. A few other people want to come out with videos saying that I'm, that I'm wrong about this. No, 
I'm not, never was, and I'm going to prove the point soon. It won't just be one scholar. If you want one, for the, for the purpose of answering that question right now, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And I'm going to be citing that heavily in this video because it over and over and over again defines faith as a belief that is not based on evidence again and again and again. Gotcha. Thanks so much. And that uh, RN's channel is linked in the description so that you can hear his case. So, Liam Ayrton, thanks for your question. He asks, can you ask Sai for the same definition of faith uh, for contrast to Aaron's answer? I think you've answered, but in case, uh, if you want, you can share again. So, well, Sai, can you, can you name a scholar who... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm a scholar. How's that? <laughs> no, I'm not a scholar in philosophy, but I think of faith as it could be a belief without evidence, but it could also be belief based on it, on evidence of some kind. It may not be pure evidence. It would not be complete evidence because then it wouldn't be faith. It would just be knowledge. But I think that you can, I mean, in my case, for example, when I started as an atheist and then I gradually lost atheism, my belief in atheism, or whatever you want to call it, uh, I, I lost that, and then I began uh, looking at evidence, and eventually, uh, even though it was not all pervasive, it was enough for me to start thinking about the possibility of faith, which then I got, thanks to the grace of the Holy Spirit, which came and gave it to me, but um, I think that faith, there are different kinds of faith, so Having just one definition, I mean, Aaron's is, is okay in some cases. I think there are people who have faith in something with, in the total absence of evidence. I, I, and it's not just religious faith. It could be faith in various scientific principles that people just hold to without really having much evidence. But it's not only that. I don't think that's the only way you can have faith. I think you can also have strong evidence-based faith. Well, I'm, I'm going to say that faith uh, is, going to ha is always going to be independent of evidence. That even if you have evidence, the evidence is irrelevant. Because you are, you are told to believe because you're told to believe. You, you, you believe because you're told to believe. It's not because of, you know, you're, you're the, but the scriptures are the word of God. They tell you to believe. You're going to go to heaven if you do, and you're going to go to hell if you don't. That's the criteria you believe. Not because of evidence. You know, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You believe what the authority tells you to believe because the authority tells you to believe it. And it doesn't matter if there is evidence or not. That's not the reason you believe. You believe because you're told to. Well, again, that's true for some people, but not everyone. Next up, we will go to Epic Christ or Epic Christ. Uh, let me know if I mispronounce it. He says, hey, the hypothesis does not have to be falsifiable. Uh, this came up pretty early in the conversation, talking about scientific theories or hypotheses and whether or not they're falsifiable. And he said, many hypotheses are not falsifiable. Philosophers have abandoned the demarc demarcation, or would it be just the falsification criterion? I think he, I think he means the falsification criterion. But so you got two things that hypotheses are looking for. And you have to be able to achieve at least one of them. One of them, you want to, you want to be able to know whether your position is right or wrong. And while a, a, a hypothesis by, you know, would break the rules to be proven right, and, and we shouldn't even think about it being in terms of proving right, you would at least show that there's a substance to it, that there's a there there, right? So you, you want to say that, that, that evolution is possible, show that there's a mechanism that actually works, and then you can extend it out to this parameter if you need to. So we can have hypothesis that establish some kind of credibility to the perspective. But then you also got to go the other way, too. If you want to know if it's right, that's the way to do it. How many things, how many different hypotheses can we compile that all indicate the same kind of thing? Good. You got to go the other way, too. It has, there has to be a way to show that it's wrong, right? Because there, if, if you can't tell whether something is right or wrong, then in science, it has literally no value. And, and I just, uh, that's right, I agree, and, and it's, I should also mention that it's much easier to show that something is wrong than that it's right. Uh, it, all you need is one fact that doesn't work, and, uh, and, and that's it, you, 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 can, you can drop. I know this because I've, I've done, you know, I've been in that position where I had a hypothesis, 
and you know, two weeks after starting working on it, I had to throw it away. Because the first experiment was, nope, that didn't work. <laughs> so forget it. So yeah, it's... Um, I think Einstein and Huxley both complained about that very thing. Yeah. A beautiful hypothesis shattered by a single fact. Ugly fact, <laughs> right, exactly. Gosh, yeah, thanks so much. And Dragnock Silvis, good to see you. Thanks for your question. He said, is Sai suggesting that there will be a way to, quote, test God one day? I think it's possible. Uh, I don't think it's impossible. So whether it will happen or not, uh, I will probably not find out unless I'm looking down from heaven and notice, but, uh, you know, I think that, yeah, I think that it, is, it could be possible just because, it, you know, the, the progress we've made in science has been so incredible and has opened up so many strange and unusual and, you know, what we would you formally call magical things that I don't think it's impossible that someday we will have we'll never have proof of God that that's I think that's theologically impossible but we might be able to come to a better understanding of what God is uh, who he is wh what his attributes are some of that may just come from studying the natural world which is if we believe uh, created by God and that gives some indication of the character of the creator if, but if I if I could tack something on uh, if I could tack something onto that I I remember suggesting a hypothetical situation, which is always funny when I'm talking to like really devout fundamentalist types, when I try to even bring up a hypothesis, or excuse me, not a hypothesis, but just a hypothetical situation, because they don't seem to be capable of that. Uh, I said, well, so what if we have this device that, that, that's, that is capable of perceiving well beyond what human senses can perceive? And this device is actually capable of detecting and measuring the properties of God. And I didn't get to go any further than that. Everybody that I was talking to, and it was one of the Usenet, Usenet groups many years ago, everybody I was talking to objected because you can't ever know the properties of God. You can't ever have proof of the properties of God. It must always be whatever you want it to be. Ah, uh, gotcha. So, so just to jump to the next one, I, Arjun Charioteer, thanks so much for your question. And they asked, uh, asked Dr. Seigart if Arne is, un is an unreasonable anti-theist and how he compares to the Freedom From Religion Foundation with love to all and then a heart emoticon. Okay, uh, the question was, do I, I didn't catch it all. Does Sai think what? Yeah, so I think he's asking if you think that Aaron is an unreasonable anti-theist and oh, okay. how he compares to the reasonableness or unreasonableness of the Freedom From Religion Foundation in, in their type of anti-theism. Mm. That's a very interesting question. I, I, I don't think Aaron is unreasonable. Of course, I don't agree with his viewpoints, but I think I've always found him a very eloquent uh, uh, thinker and uh, and reasonable. Um, now, in terms of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, I, I'm i sure Aaron will disagree with, with me because I find them to be uh, activist in a way that I find um, almost infringing on individual liberty. I, I know one story, for example, where uh, there was a group of uh, Christian volunteers who were going into a prison to do um, basically charity work with prisoners. They also did some evangelism, of course, uh, and they, but, you know, it wasn't forced. It was just anyone who was interested in the prison would come and uh, they would do Bible study, whatever. And since this turned out to be a state prison, FFRF uh, brought a lawsuit to prevent this which did nobody any good. It certainly didn't help the prisoners who look forward to these visits, though at least the ones who were interested because they were Christians uh, and they found it. And there was some charity involved, obviously. And I, just on the basis of, you know, uh, this, this requirement of uh, separating church and state, which I'm in favor of in general, 
but if this had been a private prison, it could have gone on, but the fact that it was a state prison allowed them to sue. So I find uh, some of their uh, goals, I mean, I, again, I agree with separation of church and state, as do, by the way, the great majority of Christians. In fact, the whole idea of separation of church and state in the Constitution came from Christians who did not want a particular denomination to be established as the national religion because it might not have been their denomination and therefore they would have been in trouble. <clears throat> so, you know, most of us agree with that definition, uh, with, with that prohibition of, of uh, church and state being together, but not to the extreme extent that FFRF does. And I actually sometimes, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say this is a good analogy, but they're all lawyers, they use legal means to do this, and in many ways they remind me of the other side of the Westboro Baptist Church, which is also a group of attorneys who, uh, you know, are, are, are basically misuse the word Christianity to do things which are reprehensible and do it in a reprehensible way for making money. So I, I don't have, I certainly, now Aaron might, may completely support FFRF, but I certainly don't put the two in the same category. Because I, I think he does a lot of good in the world. I don't think FFRF is any good in the world at all. Well, I, uh, as an atheist activist, one of my primary interests is in, you know, secular government and defense of the First Amendment. And that, to my experience, is exactly what FFRF is all about. And I would like, I think we should be supporting them because we have the, the, uh, the Blitz, Project Blitz right now, which is doing everything it can to undermine that separation of church and state. And this is, of course, a Christian-led group, and it's in exploiting all other Christians to support it, again, using lawyers and clever language to misrepresent whatever they can to get people to endorse this so that they can ultimately turn the United States into a theocracy. And if you want the details of this, this book was written by Andrew Seidel of FFRF, and it is a brilliant book. I've read it cover to cover, and uh, it has all the data you will ever need to know about why the United States was always a secular country was never a Christian country, and that's just propaganda to say that it was Christian. You got it. Thanks so much. And then, last one, uh, Van Dahlia, 1998. Thanks for your question. He said, okay, my question is for Arn Ra. Is he planning on making a book form of his systematic classification of life series so he can go into more detail than he could in video form? I actually think that the video format allows me to go into more detail than, I mean, the book would just be verbose, but with the book, I mean, with the, but with videos, I can, I can do pictures much more cheaply, of course. Uh, and, and, uh, there, there's, a, there's another medium that I think that I could that I can use to actually get more information out in at least in a shorter period of time. You can have illustrated books, but it's expensive. And I would look at that possibility. That's all I'm going to say. That's not going to be my next book. My next book is probably going to be one about the Quran. You got it. Thanks so much for everybody's questions, and thanks for the speakers. We appreciate you just coming here and hanging out, and uh, it's been a great time listening to you. I have a lot of positive feedback. Uh, one person said this is the best uh, they've experienced, so I'm thrilled. And, uh, yeah, again, everybody uh, want to remind you, both speakers have their links in the description. So if you're like, hmm, I like that, you can check them out directly. And also, another one is there will be an after show that's linked below, right below the speaker's links, and that's at Steve McRae's uh, link. So with that, I want to say uh, thanks for being here, everybody. We hope that you keep sifting through the reasonable from the unreasonable. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a like and have a great rest of your Sunday. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.